late Jim Coles, his fellow Virginia State graduate. Mr. Coles was the first black principal at an integrated secondary school in Montgomery County, Maryland. And of course, our dear family friend Sam Hamilton is here today. Uh, Sam's a prominent attorney in Maryland, but way back, once upon a time, Sam Hamilton was the first prosecutor in Montgomery County, Maryland. These were his close friends, brought together by shared experiences. My father and these men believed in the power of relationships with each other. He cultivated my father. He cultivated these relationships like his career depended on, and really, back then, it did. They were all they had to help each other advance. My father had a Rolodex chock full of black people working in every government agency, school system, recreation department, basketball camp in the Washington area. When other parents called 411, my father whipped out the Rolodex. He was, as you've heard, an original. He was profound. He was profoundly restless. He was nurturing, as I said. He was also explosive. At times, he was brilliant. At all times, he was brilliant. He was engaging. He was a dreamer. To me, as a boy, my father was just a force of nature. You know, he wasn't a tall man, but his stature made him appear to be larger. He walked with square shoulders thrown back, his broad chest sort of thrust forward, and he had this smooth sort of bow-legged gait. You know, it gave him something extra, what we refer to today as swag. <laughs> My pop says swag. And then there was this chin. It might have well been carved from granite. You know, wide and square, uh, with this sort of iconic cleft right at the center, and a pair of massive hands that you heard about. These hands, you know, he would use them like the flourishes of a conductor's wand when he was giving one of his animated speeches. Or he would use them as the most effective paddle God had ever made. <laughs> he was far from perfect, to be sure. He struggled with his shortcomings and often succumbed to them. But my father believed in redemption. He never stopped seeking it, whether as a result of his own failings or the failings of others, and particularly on behalf of young people. When it came to helping children and young adults, my father was his best self. If you were a young person who came into his home or to his office, you were subject to his vision for you. He quickly assessed you, sized you up, your strengths and weaknesses, whether or not you were on the right track or whether you needed to be taken down a notch. And that was the thing. He, he often saw more in you than you might see in yourself. And he would tell you. He believed the best way to help young people was to directly interact with them, to intervene in their homes, in their communities, and if need be, in their faces. When I was 12, I got into big trouble with a few of my friends. And we ended up in the police station. You know, I was scared as I could be, wearing handcuffs and sitting in a jail cell, uh, waiting for my parents to pick me up, but it, it paled to the sheer terror I felt about how my father would react. My behind, I think, is already preparing for the woman <laughs> that was sure to come. But I wasn't sure what else he'd do. You know, the bigger my transgression, the more unpredictable so when I finally got released, came out into the waiting area of the police station, I found a scene there I could not have imagined. All three of my accomplices were seated there, looking just completely pitiful. Their parents were there too. Even some of the police officers behind the counter stopped what they were doing and, and uh, paid attention. All of them were transfixed. My father was standing there, and he was midway through a blistering lecture. My father, he was, you know, he was so angry and so disappointed. In the middle of the Silver Spring police station, my father was having church. 
he was delivering his own Sermon on the Mount. And for a kid who had hoped to gain a little bit more street cred after this, this, my worst nightmare. <laughs> worst nightmare ever. The other boys, these sort of thugs in training, my father's call for them to repent was working. They were all weeping uncontrollably. <laughs> Their parents just stood there silent, never said a word. They were just as absorbed in the gospel according to Clarence as, as their children were. And meanwhile, I'm in the corner shrinking by the second. Um, but these parents look relieved. They even look grateful. And so how we chose our friends was very important to my father. When I was 15, I found out just how important that was. I made myself a new friend. He's a popular guy with the girls. He's cool with the fellas. He had a new sports car. We rolled around town like we just owned it. But my father was suspicious, and he told me so. I remember him telling me, you know, I don't like him. You know, don't, don't just follow him with your nose open. Are you a leader or are you a follower? Don't just go with the crowd. Told me it's you know it's easy to be a friend when it's all fun and games, but you know when the stuff hits the fan, you know he did not say stuff. <laughs> but when the stuff hits the fan, will he have your back? Well, not long after that, I realized that he didn't. Not long after that, I was wearing handcuffs again. I got caught up in the scheme hatched by my friend. He used me, and I'd been clueless. And as I said, my father could be unpredictable. This time, no fire and brimstone speech, no spanking, not even an I told you so. I think he recognized you know, what he saw in my face, shame and guilt. He changed tactics. Now, I was grounded, of course, forever. Just forever. <laughs> I don't think I came out of the house again until I was 17. <laughs> But he set a new sort of strict set of marching orders for me about sort of how I was to order my steps every day. Um, then, you know, I think he sort of realized that he may not have all the answers this time. So he called in reinforcements. <laughs> he called my older cousin, Daryl, who you heard from today, and he called our youth minister at church. I think he realized that, you know, I needed to hear from a different set of voices, younger men who might be able to put his lessons into a different language that I might be able to hear. It worked. From that day forward, my years of stealing, fighting, vandalism, all those things, over. Never got into a whiff of trouble again. As an adult, my relationship with my father changed dramatically. When he went away to grad school, I was happy for him, I was proud, but I was also angry. I was 19 years old. But I still felt like a kid. I, I still needed his guide. I still wanted him. So I felt left behind. I felt abandoned. Uh, my parents had just divorced. I felt like my family had been destroyed. And so as I moved further into my 20s, you know, I came to see more of my father's flaws, like every adult child does. And those flaws upset me. I was disappointed. worried I might make the same mistakes, and I resented him for making me feel that way. But then I got married, and I had my own child. And before I knew it, without thinking about it, I found myself nurturing my daughter just as he had nurtured us as children. As a professional, when I started having career challenges, and I started to doubt why I got into journalism, I started realizing that the traits that made me a good journalist, the ability to write, critical thinking, the desire to speak truth to power, these came from my father. It wasn't easy, but over time I began to forgive my father and appreciate him more for what he'd given me. And so uh, when I recently moved back to Washington, no two people were happier about this than my parents. Um, and I was struggling to make peace with uh, my own separation from my daughter at that point. But it became clear that I came home at just the right time. My father 
had slowed down and lost too much weight. He needed me. On his final day after he left us, sat beside his bedside for, for a while. And I took that big hand of his in my hand. Um, and I wanted that one last moment of strength, security. And uh, yeah. age and disease had weakened his body. But his hands, they sort of withstood the ravages. I guess I shouldn't have been surprised by that. So even then, with me and my prime, my father recently having left this earth, his hands were still larger and stronger than mine. In that moment, I got what I needed. Thank you, Dad, for holding my hand for 40 years. You are alive in all three of us. You raised three independent thinkers who never blindly follow the crowd, who are resilient, who speak truth to power, and who love fiercely, compassionately, and unconditionally. And I'll leave you with words from the man himself. I came across these in uh, his dedication during, uh, in his doctoral dissertation. This thesis is dedicated to my parents, Clarence Sr. and Grace Dave, for their support, love, and confidence in my abilities. To Mom, who taught me to carry myself in a prideful and respectful manner, and to help others as she would like to be helped. To Dad, who believed his son could be anything he wanted to be. And finally, I would like to thank my three ch adult children, Celeste, Clay, and Corey, who always expressed their love and support for Dad. Their phone calls, their cards, their tokens on special occasions, and their lifelong support gave me the extra strength to continue to the finish line.